Good evening, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Agenda-wise, I'm going to do a quick review of some concepts, um, array of objects and containment. And then my goal mainly today is to prep you for lab three so you can go off and work on it to deliver that on time. And then I'll talk about the midterm. And if we if we do have time, um, I will start talking about inheritance inheritance and polymorphism. You can expect most of that to be covered um, probably on Wednesday. So, so first thing is working with array of objects. So if I create a class and let's say it has a private property um, I can add a default constructor like uh, we are supposed to and we, we can we can make that public and then we can write a, a getter. I'm putting all of this in one line just because I want to accommodate a lot of code. Um, in one screen for you guys. To set the value of B, I can pass the value of B and set it to the instance variable. So that'll be my one class. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to create uh, another class that I'm going to call ARR because that will contain an array. And I'll make this array also ARR. And we'll make that private as well, just so we can get uh, a complete working example of working with array of objects with containment. So in the constructor of We will initialize our array. This one, I think we will need to span on a few lines. And we have to instantiate a new object for each one. Um, so 
my question to all of you is, uh, do you all know what is a null pointer exception? I would request a response from each one of you in the room, please. So I mentioned this last time. So when you try to access an object without creating it, So if I say I want an object A1, right, just like that, that's of type A. And if I say A1.B equals 55, that will create a null pointer exception. Do you see the, those of you said you did not know null pointer exception, um, I have to create an instance of, I have to create an instance of A to access the value of property B. Does that make sense? So I obviously cannot say a1.b, I'll have to say a1.setp, 55. Okay, this will create a null pointer exception. So if you create an object of type A and then you go in and say, that, then it will work. So this is to help you guys understand null pointer exception and how it works. Is everyone okay with the idea of uh, null pointer exception now? Uh, feedback please. Other people that said no, uh, uh, if you have a follow-up question, then uh, please let me know. So you have to you have to create the object every time. This is what creates the object. This is what creates the object. I'm assuming you're asking, you have to call it every time means, you have to call the constructor every time. Right. What do you mean it cannot be repeated in other places? You're creating an object. Every time you create an object, you have to say this. And you can use it, you know, if you're going to create a hundred objects, you use it a hundred times. So it, it will, it can be repeated. The constructor can be called, it's just like calling a method. So it can be repeated as many times as you want. Okay. I hope my response is clear. Yes, true. So you can also see another sample right here. I'm creating an array of type A, which is really where we are going next, right? And we create an array of three objects. I could have created an array of 100 objects. Right? 
So in this for loop, I'm creating three objects. I'm calling the new constructor three times. And I can also use any overloaded constructor if I have. But this is the default constructor. Should always be added in every class. Okay, so, so the next thing is ARR contains A. In fact, it contains an array of A. It create it contains an array of A. Okay. So if I go in main, and I was to instantiate ARR, question for you guys here. How many objects are created in bit? And I'm looking for a total count. And I'll wait for your response and um, respond once um, and then we'll give you the correct answer. This is also a good uh, exam question I can give you. I can give you a code snippet and say, okay, analyze this code and tell me how many objects are being created. So we are creating one object here, which is the ARR object itself. Then that's the first. Then we go to the ARR constructor and we are creating an array of objects. That's object number two. Then how many times are we calling new in the for loop? Very good. So the total is five. So just count the number of number of statements containing new. Okay. So this gives you, um, this is my quick review of containment with array of objects. So the way this works is bit has ARR array, which is ARR0. It has ARR1 and ARR2. And you see this array itself is an object too. And then each one of these objects 
as an object. So this is how we start using array of objects. And we're going to apply this in last three. So let's try and understand how lat three is set up. I'll go ahead and launch Eclipse. And if I remember correctly, I had imported the um, assets for lab three from the lab description into uh, Eclipse. Is everyone comfortable with taking the zip file that I've provided in lab three and downloading it to set up a project file? Oh, sorry, wrong class. So oh, yeah, there we, there we go. Please start with the source code for download that. So what this program does is it creates a store object. So I'm going to go over that in detail. So first things first, let's start with the driver. So driver, one thing that I may have mentioned last time is you might have to look for the path where you save the txt file and you may have to update the highlighted part. And the way to do that is to simply right click on properties for sales.txt once you have imported it. And then you can just copy and paste this folder into into the directory and then you should just run the program and it will print out a bunch of things and if you see data like this that's basically telling you that the data structure for you to analyze is created so The way it's working is we are making a file I.O. object. And inside file I.O. object, there are a bunch of properties. And I have a method called read data that creates a franchise object. I don't care for you guys to understand how the read data method works right now. I'll cover that when I talk about file I.O. in depth. So we'll ignore that other than the fact that that code is there ready for you to use, okay? So all this code, I want you to include in the class diagram, but we'll cover it later. I want you to um, just get it to run. Well, file name is salesstat.txt. That's the name of the file that you're reading. And it also will appear in your driver, you see, like this, except with a different path. So the way you figure out the path is, once you have set up your lab three project, you right click and you click on properties and then look at the location and copy and paste that into the constructor of the file I want. Does that help? So this is the path I took 
and then I added an extra backslash. Okay. So now we talk about array of objects. So I'm going to make some notes here for you all. So you have you have a store object that actually let me pedal back for a minute. We have a franchise object, right? So we have a franchise object which has an array of stores. So we have store zero, The file, if you look at sales.txt, sales it says number six, right? So that actually creates a total of six stores. Please do not modify that file just because the code is kind of, it conforms to six stores. So I'm just helping you understand the structure. So you have a total of six stores like that, index value zero through five. Obviously, because we don't want null pointer exception, I'm creating a new store for each one. Right? So, and then inside each store, we have sales by week. So, we, there is a sales by week two dimensional array. Your goal should be to try and understand this while you are here so you can work on your lab assignment fairly quickly without costing you a lot of time because the key part is to understand this data structure. So you see my franchise in main, if I look at the driver, it's called F. So my franchise is called F. Um, within franchise, there are stores. And that's the variable I have here. And then we instantiate the store object and then we have sales by week. So inside franchise, these are all private data members. You know, I have stores is private, um, sales by week is private. So we will basically say F dot if I have to read a store, I will I will call the get method. So you see this get store and such store. You guys will most likely be just working with um, get store. So if you want to analyze a store. That's what you will say, right? And then if you want to get the 
sale numbers from the store I did not provide a get method I provided a, a set method which I'm using already for setting the values and I have print data that's all Then what I'm expecting is for you guys to write these six functions. So let's go back to the lab description. And the program should display this following information. Now you see, uh, when you are in the store object, you have the two dimensional array to do all of this work. So what you have to do is you have to go through the two dimensional array which is which is looking at sales by week and you have to print total sales for each week. So if you are given a two dimensional array, are you able to um, kind of go through this idea of calculations? And I'll just help you visualize it. So imagine I have a two-dimensional array, which is uh, five by seven. So those are my five weeks, and these are my seven days. And so for the first part, you have to print, I mean, if each one of these values was, say, 1, then you have to go across and compute the total. And this is what is expected in part A, right? That's why it says it should print five values, one for each week. In part B, you take what you compute in part A and you divide it by, you divide it by seven. So, right? In part C, 
you have to print total sales for all weeks. So you can again use A and just do a summation. Okay. Then we have average weekly sales. Should print one value as well. So you take uh, UC and divide it by five. The week with highest amount in sales and lowest amount in sales. So UC to find the highest value. And then you see to find the lowest value. So those, those are all the things that you guys have to do. Now for um, each of the calculation, for each calculation from A through F, Create a new instance variable in stores class. Write a function for each operation to only do the calculation. Do not print the value. And then finally, write a print method that has maybe signature like that, print stats, int i. And then what you do in this case is you say switch I case zero print statement for A or calculation A and then break. So this is how you print the statistics. So make sure you can only, this will only be successful, meaning you'll only be successful in printing each value separately 
if you, in fact, create a new instance variable for each calculation. So then you can update the driver to prompt the user for store numbers and then operation. User wants to see the value for. So you should update the driver to prompt the user for something like this. Do while user is not done. Prompt for store number and operation. And you might have another loop here. I might say data for which operation. And this will be while user is done, not done with operations and user is not done with store. Is this uh, design logic clear to you guys? This is lab three. So if you were to follow these notes down the path, let's go through one item at a time. Do you all understand how the structure is organized? And I'm looking for responses from the room. Great. Then next question is, do you understand how these operations can be calculated using a two-dimensional array? Again, requesting responses. Then for each of those calculations, you have to make sure you create six instance variables, one for each operation. And then finally, write the sprint method. So it's actually, I would say the design is pretty nicely laid out for you. And then you update the driver to you can either do this in main, and what I would say is for doing this part, try to do this as elegantly as you can in your code. Use maybe a new class or method. My preference is you use a UI class, like you create a um, create a UI class if you can. Otherwise, do your best. Do test runs about uh, four or five with different stores. and different operations 
maybe also some invalid input values as well, right? And then also create a class diagram for an entire program. and submit. Okay. Lab three. Uh, I welcome any questions you all may have. Uh, I'll give you a couple of minutes for that, and then uh, I'll move on to the next topic of inheritance and polymorph. Any questions, anybody? Okay, well, uh, if something comes up, let me know. Uh, let's go ahead and take a seven minute break. It's 6.47, so we'll resume at 6.55. So should business methods store the functions that will carry out the calculation and print them out? That's correct. So all these um, A through F will be called, we use the term business methods because of financial calculations. So the, those methods will carry out the calculations and then you print them out in a separate method. And you probably can already see the value in doing this for, you know, if, if the user says store one, operation two, then you can just call the print stats function for that. So, mm -hmm. All right, let's take a little break and we'll be back at 655 folks. Thank you everyone. So our next part is talking about inheritance and polymorphism to See if we can get you ready for um, lab four. So assignment four is um, going to be due on July 23rd. So um, I think the theory for uh, lab four, I'll be able to cover most of it today. So I know you guys like video, like detailed video lectures for your reference. So I'll provide those for um, lab four, um, which is we will have. A few lectures. One is on inheritance. Uh, we'll have one on packages.
scope and wrapper classes. And then one will be on review of inheritance and polymorphism. And the other is on doing assignment for. So inheritance is taking properties from parent class and using it in childhood. So I can create a parent class with one property and then I can create a child class that extends the parent and if in main I create an object of type C Memory for X is allocated in C because X is inherited because of extends. Extends P means inheritance. This is the story of inheritance. The reason we use inheritance is to um, property reuse between parent and child. So child can have its own properties as well. So now we will say that memory for X and Y is allocated. We kind of have the standard constructor and the overloaded constructor, and we can have a method called square and we can simply um,
print the, or we can compute the value of square as x times x. Or to make it a little bit more meaningful, let's call it multiply, or just mal. But in the child class, I can also have the exact same method. I can have the exact same method, and I can say m is equal to x. Uh, this time will be y times y. This method is considered to be an overridden method. This method is considered to be an overridden method. Why? Because the first line of the method is identical in parent and child. If I write a constructor in child, I can accept a value for both x and y, but I can All the I can use super x and this will super is used for calling the constructor in the parent class. is used for calling the constructor in the parent class. And then we have this dot y equals y. So when we look at inheritance as you as it's laid out in front of you you've got a, a class with properties and methods in parent and the class with a child class that extends parent and has its own properties and methods Does the compiler know which parent constructor should be called? It depends on the signature. When you say super x, the 
then because you are passing an integer it will call the constructor with the um, one integer that is being accepted. So what is inheritance here is that when I create C1, M is calculated by mul, so it doesn't have to be initialized. Uh, we don't need a super for that because we're not looking to initialize M. But regardless, whether you use this constructor or this one, um, M will be set to zero because it's a instance variable. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to write a few statements here on the right side, which we'll copy down into notes later. But if I create an object of type P, then I get that. I get the X, the M, and all that. In fact, I can feed a value like this, and then I can call p1.mul. And that'll compute 44 square. Now, if I instantiate C1, and I call mul, what is the value of, actually for ease of like simple math, let's make this 5 and here mul is what, 25? And here, what's the value of uh, mul? If anybody can answer that quickly. 16. Good. Now, Java also allows for me to set up something like this. This is, this will compile correctly. Not a problem. Okay? The statement will compile. So I say P, P1 equals nil C, 7, 6. So now if I say P1 dot mul, what will be the value of M? So 
So now M is 36. Why? Because it's calling the null method in class C. It's calling the null method in class C. So in this situation, cannot be called. If let's say I had a print method and I print value of I'm not going to write the strict uh, print statements but let's say I print value of x and m and I go in and I say p1 dot print something like that it will actually print the value of x it will print the value of x which is going to be 7 it will print 7 and 30 So one question for you guys is, that, did this make sense to everybody? Because this is the starting point for polymorphism. I do encourage you guys to watch my video lecture as well, you know, in addition to whatever I'm covering right now over here. So we'll go ahead and create a new array of size 3. So now I have an array of objects and I can assign objects of type P or C to it because of uh, inheritance and if I If I were to initialize each one of these with different values, and then I was to call the mul method. You can see the value of, of polymorphism. For index value 0 and 2, null method in parent is called. And 
for index value 1, null method and child is gone. One name, different meaning for null method. And this becomes polymorph. That's the idea that we are trying to cover or bring to bear in this example. Let me go ahead and copy all this in your notes so you have it at your disposal for review. Any questions on inheritance and polymorphism example that I just covered from a syntax perspective? Or the same question would be, does everyone understand what I'm covering here? Okay, it does take a couple of tries, I mean, to, you know, go over. So replaying this lecture or my video that I provided earlier might be a good idea. Okay, so let me go ahead and save the notes. Um, there are a few more things to to cover. Working with strings and string buffers. So, strings in Java is a array of characters that's fixed in size and it's immutable. So if I said string a1 equals b1 and string a2 equals b1, it actually creates memory for b1, one instance. with A1 and A2 pointing to it. So in fact, A1 and A2 point to the same memory location. So if I go in later and I say A1 equals uh, C2, then uh, a new string is created. with value C2. A new string is created with value C2, and that's it. Thank you. 
So if we want to compare strings, we can with uh, A1 and A2, we can actually say if A1 is equal to A2, then true. talking about string comparison. If I create a new string like this with value b1 in it and I create another string b2 and then if I try to say this say if b1 is equal to b2, then we are comparing objects. So So I would say that the condition here is true. But condition here is false. So when you are comparing objects, string objects, you have to use the equals method. So you can say if d1 dot equals b2 then it will compare value and not object reference think about that for a moment when we are either working with literals um, or objects. So, so as a practice, if using string literals, you can use equality operator to compare. If using string objects, then use uh, dot equals method to compare values. Otherwise, you are comparing
preferences. Then we also have string buffers. An object that can be used for reallocating characters and strings. Meaning one memory location that's allocated can be expanded in size or shrunk in size. It can either be expanded in size or shrunk in size. Well, you resize to a smaller size. So let's go over to um, Canvas and take a quick look. I, I, I should have some notes on string and string buffers. So the way you um, shrink the size, Natalie, is you set the length to a smaller value. And then it truncates. OK? So you create a string buffer like this. In fact, let's go ahead and take this code and just so you guys can understand how string buffers work. So when we take the actual string that's allocated, we're going to produce original string colon plus object language. And then uh, whatever the length is of object language will print that value. And then we go through the for loop. We come up with the value P using I plus one. And then we want to print out that using str dot char at method. So this is printing the string one character at a time. We can also take the string buffer and convert it to a string. Um, index of gives me the index of gives me the location of where the word language starts. And I'm inserting or the word oriented between object and language. So then my newer string would look like object oriented programming. And I can add an apostrophe at location six, which is after the word object, and will print out the new string with the apostrophe. And then if I append in the end, it will the new string becomes object oriented programming improves security. So
So hopefully this helps you guys out a little bit in working with string buffers. So. so one takeaway from all this is please do not use string concatenation in printf or println to print large strings. It will slow the JVM and potentially crash it. Why? New memory allocation for each string. Each string is, uh, strings are immutable. Please keep that in mind. Okay. So I think we are getting pretty close to getting ready for lab four. Um, I still have to talk about packages, wrapper classes, and scope, which I'll do. I'll do. I'll work on these topics on Wednesday. But I'll talk briefly about your midterm. Your midterm will run from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. on July 23rd, Monday. There will be no lecture on Monday. Okay, which means I'll probably start preparing you all for Lab 5 probably on Wednesday as well. And like as always, I'll provide very um, detailed instructions. Um, exam will be online. And a few minutes before 7, uh, before 6 p.m., excuse me, I will email the exam to class. Uh, you'll most likely get six questions to answer, uh, either out of uh, six or eight, depending on how the midterm end, ends up getting written. Exam will be open book and notes. Um, you have to be uh, work. You'll be working on writing or reading code. You'll be working on reading or writing code. And topics, everything that's covered by Wednesday. Everything that's covered by Wednesday, which will be July 18th. Okay. Any questions about the midterm? And when completed, you email back to CSLabs05 at gmail.com. Um, a sample midterm is uploaded for your reference. So you can try out those questions to get an idea of what you will be getting on the exam. Okay. This is all for tonight. I'll see you all on Wednesday, same time, same place. Have a great evening, everybody.